as Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's army was tearing up Georgia from Atlanta to the sea, Confederate General John Bell Hood realized that his army was unable to stop it. So General Hood decided on an invasion of his own into Tennessee. General Hood's army had always fought gallantly, but was never quite able to deliver a knockout blow. Hood had recently led his army in many costly and sometimes disastrous attacks in battles around Atlanta and at Franklin, Tennessee. Hood now had only about 24,000 men. Behind strong defensive positions in Nashville, Union General George Thomas was collecting an army of about 55,000 soldiers. General Thomas, it was said, had a look that would freeze skulkers in their tracks. Many of the Union soldiers feared General Thomas more than they feared the Southern Army. Hood's Confederate Army of Tennessee arrived just south of Nashville on December 5, 1864. realized he was outnumbered more than two to one and the Yankees were in good fortifications, the southern leader wisely decided against a frontal attack. Hood now found himself in a very difficult position. He knew he couldn't win if he attacked Thomas's stronger force. He couldn't sidestep Nashville and march north because he figured Thomas would attack his army in the flank or rear if that was tried. couldn't even retreat because he believed his demoralized army would probably melt away. The only option left for Hood was to fortify a line just south of Nashville in hope that Thomas would attack him. had lost faith in their commander's ability to lead and win. Meanwhile, General Ulysses S. Grant was nervous. He had General Robert E. Lee pinned down in Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia. But Grant was very concerned that Hood would give Thomas the slip and moved to reinforce Lee's army, which would upset everything. It seemed the North was finally about to defeat the South, so Grant repeatedly ordered Thomas to attack Hood. But Thomas refused to do so until everything was ready. Thomas's Union Army of the Cumberland was stocking up on food, ammunition, and horses. Thomas carefully planned his attack to ensure success. Just when he was ready, a massive winter storm of freezing rain coated the landscape with ice. Movement was impossible, and Thomas now had to wait for the ice to melt. 
Grant would not tolerate any further delays and dispatched an officer to Tennessee to relieve Thomas of his command. But by December 15th, the ice melted, and before Grant's order arrived, Thomas attacked Hood. a diversionary attack of black soldiers against the Confederate right. Thomas believed the rebel left was the weaker end of their line and determined to send his heaviest attack against that weak spot. Corps would press the center to support whichever side might make a breakthrough. Somehow, a Confederate artillery battery managed to hold off Thomas's main attack for two hours. troops from his right to reinforce his left. Then Thomas sent in his reserves. crumbled, and Thomas believed his victory was complete. Thomas ordered his men to halt for the night. But his generals knew Hood was a stubborn, snappy fighter, and they told General Thomas the battle wasn't over yet. The next morning, the Yankees found the rebels in a shorter and stronger position about two miles south of the previous day's action. There were Hood's men, drawn up in a battle line and ready to fight again. General Thomas decided to use the same plan that worked so well yesterday. He sent another diversionary attack against the rebel right on Overton Hill. But the Yankees, who were themselves disorganized and exhausted from yesterday's battle, could not launch the main Union attack against the rebel left until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon.
Thomas's attack on Overton Hill was repulsed. The Union troops advanced steadily against the Confederate line. Dismounted Union cavalry, armed with repeating rifles, got in behind Hood's men and laid down a deadly fire in the Southerners' left flank. Although the Confederate right still held firmly, Hood's left and center broke and began to panic. General Thomas said the cheering was the voice of the American people. Hood had no choice but to order a retreat south. The retreat was well covered by Southern cavalry under the command of General Nathan Bedford Forrest. The remnants of Hood's brave army of Tennessee finally reached safety in Mississippi. It was about the only time in the Civil War that a Confederate army had been driven in panic from a battlefield. General Hood of Texas, who had already lost an arm and a leg in service to the Confederacy, was whipped, and he knew it. Help! Help! His army was defeated and disintegrating, and Hood's spirit was broken. Hood resigned his command a few weeks later. General Thomas was thrilled to have won the Battle of Nashville. To everyone he saw, he shouted, Didn't I tell you we could lick him? Didn't you see him run? Didn't I tell you? Yeah! After years of fighting, the Yankees had at last broken the Confederate Army of Tennessee. The Northern forces lost a number of soldiers killed, wounded, captured, and missing. Southern Army was in bad shape as well. The Union fleet's blockade had finally isolated the South from the rest of the world. General Lee was pinned down in Virginia, Sherman was devastating Georgia, and yet another Confederate army in the West was cut off from the East. Now, with the virtual destruction of Hood's army, most Southerners began to believe that the Confederacy's days were numbered.
Junior Civil War Reenactors is a unique learning experience that has been highly praised by students, parents, and teachers. The program has been featured on television and in newspapers. A major Civil War battle was fought this week in Weld County. It was actually part of a living history lesson. The soldiers came from the ranks of a middle school in Evans. Roger Wolf reports from the front lines. The fate of the Confederacy is at stake here on the outskirts of Chattanooga. The rebel forces are fighting to keep the Yankees from taking Tennessee. They're trying to take our land away. The blue and gray skirmish back and forth through the woods and hills. This is shaping up as one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. The fighting is fierce here on the banks of Chickamauga Creek and the casualties are mounting. I think I got shot three times now. <laughs> The withering fire from cannon and rifles tests the courage of soldiers on both sides of the battle. How do you keep your men motivated? <laughs> we don't, <laughs> really. They're just sort of roaming around. They just, you yell at them and then they usually listen after a while. And it isn't just men fighting in this battle. I didn't think they let ladies fight in the Civil War. Now they do. Now is 1993, and these soldiers are students from two schools in Evans. They're staging this battle to bring a history lesson to life. This Battle of Chickamauga was about the last uh, big Confederate victory. It was the biggest battle of the Western theater. Daryl Osborne is a history buff who started a business recreating battles for schools. He provides the uniforms, guns, swords, cannons, and sound effects the schools provide the soldiers who get a learning experience no book or movie can duplicate. There's a lot more to it than <clears throat> books say. It's, it's a lot harder. What I've learned from this is how difficult it must have been for the uh, people to organize this sort of thing. I mean, we've got about 100 students out here, and I feel like I've just been working like crazy to get it ready. And they, in this particular battle, there were like over 60,000 men on each side. I don't think it'd be really fun in life, but this is just for fun, so it's pretty cool. After their fun day on the battlefield, these student soldiers head back for the classroom, back to 1993. In Evans, Roger Wolf, 9 News. Thousands of students have actively participated in this program. The purpose of Junior Civil War reenactors is to create a lasting interest in Civil War history. The students, 4th through 7th grade, develop true appreciation of the subject because they experience a little bit of the Civil War soldier's life. They learn and remember details that normally have little meaning to them if only read from a book. Uniforms are hot. Equipment is heavy. Marching makes the feet tired. Officers can be obnoxious. Terror of being in a battle serve to create a feeling of respect and appreciation for the hardships and dangers of the Civil War soldier. Yet, students report the experience is one of the most fun things they have ever done at school. What do you think? Did you have a good time? Yeah. Did you guys learn something? Yeah. What did you, what'd yeah. you learn? We, what was learned, the biggest thing that you learned? we learned how hard it was to carry all that stuff on our backs. And hot clothes. Hot. Yeah. I'm learning that they had a lot of the battle is preceded by about 10 hours of training spread out over two weeks. The students get a bit of light military drill and are taught how to fight the mock battle safely. They are encouraged to employ their best acting skills as a movie is made from each reenactment. The kids love it and exhibit newfound self-control. Students are shown real Civil War equipment and they are encouraged to ask questions throughout the training period. Safety rules and procedures reinforce respect for the safety of fellow students. The students realize that although reenacting a battle is fun, being in a real Civil War battle would not be fun at all. Most students come away with an enlightened and sobering understanding of the American Civil War. The lesson makes them better informed world citizens.
Students develop a camaraderie with their unit and their school. Parents are delighted when their children, possibly for the first time, come home enthused and excited about history. My daughter has been talking about it for months. Really? And every night when she comes home and Daryl's been there working with him, she goes through everything that he's talked about. The conversations at home prior to this actually happening, an amazing amount of awareness and the, yeah. the futility of the whole thing. So it's been a good learning experience. Do you, th do you think that this would be something that uh, could be used more widespread in our community? Well, I'd like to see it. I think it would be wonderful. You know, get them out of the classroom and do some real life experience type things. See, see. Exactly. And I think it's a good one. Teachers are enthusiastic about this program because of its integrated curriculum possibilities. This is the second year that we've had Daryl come and do a Civil War battle reenactment. And, uh, in all the things that we do in the summer, when the kids came back this year, they wanted to know if Daryl was coming back. When they found out he was, some of them planned their whole summer around this week. He's a good storyteller, and he has little stories that he talks about the Civil War that really brings the era to life for these kids. They're not only learning about the Civil War, but one of the benefits that I saw, one of the things I was impressed about was but they also learn how to shoot a movie. They set up scenes and, and take a shot, and uh, it's just another, another benefit of the program that we've noticed. It is a truly unique program that can involve teachers, parents, and the community. Best of all, the Junior Civil War reenactment program is not expensive. To find out how to get a reenactment for your elementary or middle school, please contact Junior Civil War reenactors. Area code 303-935-9292.